Hello, this is Georgina Rose, part-time esoteric content creator and part-time center of pestilence, and welcome back to the Dot Darling YouTube channel. In this video, as part of my Occult 101 series, which is a series where I give beginner introductions to topics related to the occult, mysticism, religion, esoterica, um, we're going to be talking about evocation. First, there is a little bit of housekeeping I want to do that I wanted to talk about with you guys. So I have been on a hiatus. That's why I've not been posting. Um, I'm back, back to normal. I'm going to be here every other week. Thank you guys for sticking around during that period of not posting. Uh, there was some stuff I had to take care of, but that is done. We are moving to the new chapter from the death card always brings new life after all. So we're back as well. We are in the void. I feel like this is sort of like a returned tradition. I used to always shoot in the void. We're back in the void. This is because I'm actually redoing my set entirely. I'm moving some things around in my apartment. I'm making my apartment a little cuter. So there's gonna be a whole new set next video. Uh, but right now I'm still moving things around. So we're in the void. It feels kind of comfortable being back in the void. I haven't been here in a while. It's it's good to be back. Feels very much like I'm coming back to my roots. And since I am coming back to my roots, we're going to be talking about ceremonial magic again and how to break into that. So what is evocation? Simply, evocation is when you summon a spirit and make it appear externally. It gets a little more complicated than that, but that's the base of it. So I'm going to simplify this. It is a little more complicated, but for the distinction, I'm going to make it really simple. So when you summon a spirit, there are sort of two ways to do it. And that would be invocation and evocation. So I think the easiest way to tell these apart is just to look at the letter that starts them. I and E. Internal for invocation, external for evocation. When I was new, I confused these words a few times. And then when I realized like where those words come from, it made a lot of sense to me. And I no longer confused those two phrases. It made a lot of sense. So invocation is when you call a spirit into you, when you welcome them into your body and they enter you. This is more commonly done and this is typically done a little less formally. This may sound weird because you would think calling a spirit into you gives them a bit more control, but invocation is used with a lot of spirits. If you're someone who was sort of raised Christian, especially if you had a folksy sort of raising, you're going to notice that some prayers are actually called invocations. Uh, it's not as common in mainline Christianity, but in certain prayer books you can kind of see that word used here and there. Um, as well, if you're new to paganism and we were talking about calling spirits into you, like say you're doing the charge of the goddess, it's a very classic Wiccan ritual, that is an invocatory ritual. Now, evocation is done in a more advanced way. I know this sounds weird. You would think if a spirit's new to you, you wouldn't want them inside their body, you want them externally. But the reason why evocation is trickier is because to evoke, you must invoke. So you actually have to do both to do any sort of evocation because what evocation is, is when you call a spirit into you and then you call a spirit outside of you and you use the spirit inside of you to command that external spirit, making them do your will. That sounds a bit weird, but in many traditions, especially Abrahamic ones, which evocation is most found in Abrahamic traditions, though it is not exclusive to them, you are typically calling a more powerful spirit into you to command a less powerful spirit outside of you. In these Abrahamic traditions, you will notice that there are almost always spirit hierarchies. They are ranked. Even in pagan traditions or modern eclectic witchcraft, you're going to notice not all spirits are created equal. Some are objectively more powerful than others. I'm going to give an easy example. So many people have encountered ghosts in their life, right? They've been into a room, it's been cold, it's been weird, they've heard begging and clattering, and they're like, oh, that's a ghost. That spirit is a pretty low tier spirit. Whereas if you are talking about like Persephone, Persephone is obviously more powerful than that house spirit. Even if you're someone who doesn't like to think in terms of hierarchy or someone who doesn't like hierarchy as a concept, you have to admit that not all spirits are the same. There are some spirits that for me, I avoid like the plague. There are certain spirits that I will never work with magically. And if I do, I will have to have changed a lot before then, right? Whereas there are others that I don't even think twice. If you're a ceremony magician, you've probably noticed that certain rituals you get more nervous about and you feel desire to do more prep towards, whereas others, you don't really think about it, right? You're just like, okay, I can just do that right now. So we're talking about using the big spirits to command the little ones. 
And I think this is a question that I addressed a little bit in my Goetia video because Goetia is a sort of subtype of evocation. It's one that comes up a lot. Uh, most people think of evocation immediately go to the Solomonic stuff, though it is not exclusive to Solomonic magic. That is a misconception. And they sort of get into this headspace where they're like, is it ethical to evoke? Is this like demon abuse? I know that demonologists or people who like worship demons get very like PETA for demons about this and get really mad and they're like, evocation is abuse. Um, I'm going to argue against that just very quickly. I, I gave this argument before in my Goetia video, but the argument is if you're looking from a Christian framework, you're going to understand that not all spirits have free will, meaning that it's not even their choice to be evoked. They don't have free will. They're not like people. Uh, the idea that humans have free will is a very unique concept in the Abrahamic tradition, whereas demons don't as well. They're basically evil uh, in a Christian framework. So Morally, it's probably not that bad. I think we've all used moral righteousness at some point in time to be an asshole to someone. You see it a lot in modern culture. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think it's not that bad. But if you are not in that lens, I can see seeing it as bad and being like, wow, this is misunderstanding. Because many of the demons, especially those found in the Goetia, do appear in other cultures as different types of spirits. Uh, one of the most interesting things about occultism is that a lot of these spirits you'll notice appear in different traditions in various ways. You will notice when we look at Lilith, who is sort of a hot button popular spirit, there were actually Lilithus, a class of spirit that existed in the Canaanite region prior to Lilith becoming the Judaic spirit that she is known for today. So even within that, these spirits appear in different ways. And with Lilith in particular, there are many different so, so interestingly, let me explain. People talk about Lilith in so many different ways that it's sort of like Lilith is multiple spirits. I have a little theory about this. A friend of mine has a whole theory where he thinks that there's like multiple Liliths, but it's a whole different topic. But you will notice that in different traditions and different worldviews, people are gonna think of spirits differently and think of classes of spirits entirely differently to the point where they almost seem like different spirits altogether. And perhaps maybe they are. So if you evoke a spirit, what actually happens? Why are we doing this? We're not just doing it for fun. There are reasons why you would evoke and it does give you things. So the first reason is if you are doing something like the Abramelon ritual, which I have a video on, it does require at the end of the Abramelon ritual that gives you a holy guardian angel to bind the kings of hell. So for some bigger rituals, like say you're trying to, you know, ascend in certain ways or meet your holy guardian angel, sometimes the ritual will require binding to sort of show your magical prowess. As well, you can use it to get things. If you look at many of these older grimoires, which I'm gonna list a few grimoires that talk about evocation, uh, and I'm going to start with ones about demons because that's the most simple one and then I'm going to move to some that don't. Uh, Grimoire Verum, uh, Cross Keys, which is a collection of the Indicron and a few other grimoires. Uh, the Keys of Solomon, obviously the Black Pullet. These grimoires, each spirit is sort of listed in a catalog and they're given certain things that they can give you and represent. Some of them are kind of funny because you'll like be told to evoke a spirit to give you the skills of you know, blacksmithing, right? Uh, but to have evoked it, you have to have already made all these tools. So in a sense, you kind of learned it on the way there. Other ones, completely not. Uh, certain ones will give you riches. Certain ones will help you find love. They'll, they'll do all the things that spirits sort of do. And the interesting thing about these spirits is they typically have pretty specific epithets. Uh, I know there's one spirit that like helps you find a book you're looking for. If you can't find the book, uh, that's one of my favorite demon epithets. Uh, if I was a demon, that's the demon that I want to be. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it can be used for a variety of things, uh, especially if you're someone who is maybe more Abrahamic leaning, you'll notice that when you do things like saint workings or calling to angels, they're typically not wanting to delve with those super material things. Some do, but oftentimes they're like, that's not really our domain. And so you would go to the demons for that. Um, and since you are evoking them, it's not seen as veneration. Uh, in those traditions, venerating them is completely banned. However, in modern occultism, there's an entire subculture of demon auditors. I can make a video on that if you guys are very curious. It's not a system that I relate to. I personally do not feel drawn to worshiping them just because I see them as sort of lower level spirits. It doesn't make sense to me, but I can talk about why people do it because I do understand why people do it. It just doesn't make sense for my personal practice. When I say don't make sense, it doesn't mean I'm judging those people um, or anything like that. It's just something that I don't relate to, but I do understand why people do it. In terms of non-demon related stuff, uh, there's a really cool grimoire called the Arbital that I actually want to make an entire video on because I've personally been working with the Arbital. Uh, the Arbital is often told to people as the first book to try evocation. I tend to dislike this whole like starter spirit concept where like certain spirits are seen as beginner spirits, certain spirits are seen as more advanced spirits. 
and depending on your level you're supposed to work with different spirits because i think that kind of misses the point of you know why you would work with specific spirits i think you should work with specific spirits for specific reasoning i don't think you should do it because you're a beginner but arbitel is a bit more simple it's more beginner friendly and it basically is about calling what is known as the olympic spirits so the olympic spirits are not demons very specific class of spirits that relate to the various planetary bodies which i like planetary magic i'm really into the planetary stuff so it's sort of right up my alley uh, and in those, you are still evoking, but you're evoking in a less aggressive way. If you look at the actual sort of way you do it, it's a bit shorter and a bit less aggressive, right? Like in Goetia, you often have to bind the spirit to the triangle outside the circle. Whereas in the Arbitel, they don't really give super clear instructions of how to do it. I've actually had to read up blogs on like, okay, so I see we have to do these prayers. What specifically do we do? Um, and some of those websites and blogs of people's experiences have been incredibly vital. I actually made a video for my Patreon last month about um, how I prepare to work with the new grimoire and how I do my research on that. So check out my Patreon for that one. Uh, I talk specifically about my Arbitel process and how I've gotten to where I am. So check it out. But yeah, any spirit that is in, if you're a Christian or an Abrahamic person, you're going to notice that there are only specific spirits you can work with. But if you're pagan, you can still do this. For me, I'm not Abrahamic, but I do think there's truth in those systems to some extent. And even though I do self-identify as a pagan, I do do evocation because certain types of spirits for me make more sense to evoke based on my worldview and my system. And I have had pretty good results. Uh, a big piece of advice is I think it is a very bad idea to mix your evocation and invocation with the same spirits because spirits obviously don't want that. It's confusing and I think it's um, incoherent. A big problem I notice in modern occultism is that people's systems become kind of incoherent, right? So their system will not align with itself. They'll have things that contradict each other within their practice and I think that's something to avoid. I think that we have this sort of everything is legitimate, everything is true belief in the modern occult scene due to a variety of factors. I think it's because modern occultism is a huge chaos magic influence as well. Uh, there are a few other things. I can get into my theories on that but you want your practice to be consistent, right? You don't want to be evoking and invoking the same spirits because obviously that's, it doesn't make sense, right? Um, and if you're someone who only invokes, just stick to that and that's fine. So to prepare for evocation, it typically is a bit more exhaustive because you've got to do it in multiple steps. First, you're always going to want to purify whenever you're working with very celestial spirits, which for reference, there are celestial spirits and there are terrestrial spirits and there are chthonic spirits. This is a little bit of my own UPG, but it's something I've noticed. And a few other people have commented on this before. So celestial spirits are those very high, angelic, high, I don't want to say high vibrational because I feel like that makes me sound like a new ager, but you know what I mean? They're like, they're above human comprehension. They're beyond us. They're not about mundane needs. There's those. And then there's the terrestrials. Those are the spirits like the fae. Uh, you could argue demons. Some people argue demons are sort of fae, which that's a whole conversation. We can get into that another time. Uh, your land spirits, the spirits that are of the land um, the, uh, that we live on. They're of our plane. They're of our field. And then there are the chthonics, which are those that are basically from below us, from hell. The gatekeepers to death. This will be your death spirits, stuff like that. Like Hecate would go here. Um, and blending those in a practice I actually find is very effective. I think you should blend it all together. Um, there is a theory about how people in various ancient cultures used to work with specifically a celestial and a terrestrial. Um, so I think it's very good to blend them. But you are working with a celestial spirit to evoke either a terrestrial or a chthonic spirit. So to work with anything celestial, you have to purify. Ritual purification is so important. Many of these grimoires specifically will call for fasting, abstinence from sex. Temporarily, you don't need to, you don't need to freak out. You don't need to be like, oh, she's taking my sex from me. No, temporarily, take your Xanax, take the Xanax. It's okay. I'm not saying sex bad. Just you got to abstain a little bit before a ritual to purify. Uh, no drinking, um, avoiding technology. This is something that I think is important now. I digitally fast and as well as good for our heads. Scrolling aimlessly on Twitter is just terrible for anyone's mental health. I don't think anyone benefits from that. Uh, and you're going to want to prepare. You may want to wear specific colors, cleanse, do your purifying bath, wash your hands, stuff like that. Um, and then you're going to begin the first step. This is typically a series of prayers and then an invocation. The most famous one would be the bornless ritual or the headless ritual, which is used primarily with Goetic and PGM related stuff and in modern communities with the Holy Guardian Angel type stuff. 
something like that. Uh, with the Arbitel, it's a little different because they give a set list of prayers and I find that they're a little less aggressive, but regardless, you need to invoke, you need to pray, and then you get to that point where you have God in you, you've invoked, you're ready. Then at this point, you're going to want to prepare your circle. If you are doing a grimoire, oftentimes they will make you draw a big circle on the floor. This is when I do it. A lot of people do it before the invocation. I think it doesn't really make sense to because you want to sort of charge and concentrate the circle. If you're using a mat, this is when I like to just roll that thing out. Uh, and then on the outside of your circle, if you're doing certain things, you may want to use a triangle of art, which I have one, I've held up in a few videos, basically like a black mirror triangle. If not, you can just use a black mirror or something to scry with, scrying bowls can even work. Or, I mean, if you have some other way of doing it, do it your way. Different grimoires require different things. Uh, as well, you're probably gonna have to put on certain layman's, burn certain instances, follow the procedure of whatever grimoire you're working with. We're talking generally about evocations, so I'm not gonna get into specific grimoire procedures. If you want me to do a video about any specific grimoire, comment it below. I really like talking about grimoire stuff. I've been kind of into it recently. So comment if you want any specific grimoire below and I can go through the entire start to finish process with you guys. But then you get that and then you're gonna start the evocation process, which is essentially a summoning. It's a call and then you have it externally and then you do your ritual and you're going to need to, and I emphasize this very heavily, banish and depart very seriously. Because when you are evoking, you have another spirit there and that spirit is being bound and you need to have it under control. Aleister Crowley, one of his biggest magical mistakes actually related to this because he stepped outside the circle during a ritual and then his life got worse. So when you do an evocation, you have to stay put Stay put, do not go to the bathroom, pee before your ritual. Do not need to go pee in the middle of your evocation. That will be a problem. I guess hold it in, I, I don't know. Rituals don't take that long, just hold it in, okay? Hold it in. But you really desperately need to banish and banish well. Typically, like in Arbitel has a license to depart that's written in there specifically. Do that and then do some more. Build on top of it. A lot of these rituals I build on. I add things. I add the LBRP and things like that because you really desperately need to cleanse and banish. You do not want a bound spirit just vibing in your apartment. It's a bad idea. So I wanna emphasize this so hard. If you are not competent with banishing, purifying and releasing spirits from your space, do not evoke. I'm not trying to be an asshole. I'm not trying to be a gatekeeper. I'm trying to give you good, useful advice. And that is that you need to be able to successfully banish spirits to evoke. So you're gonna banish that external spirit, then banish the one inside of you and leave offerings. Um, sometimes you wanna leave offerings in the middle of rituals, depends on how, where you leave offerings in rituals, because offerings are pretty much always required for ritual. Depends on the ritual you're doing, that varies uh, as well. Sometimes it's not specifically stated, so leave it when you want to in the ritual or when it makes sense based on the specific ritual. But please, please banish. I emphasize this again, because it's that important. So my advice for this is to have some experience before you start evoking things. If you really want to start with evocation, I can't stop you. I'm not your mom. You don't have to listen to me. I'm a girl on the internet. Um, and as well, please, please, please read the grimoire you work with multiple times. Make sure the spirits you're working with, you're using them for a reason, whether it's for something like the Abermelon where you have to bind specific spirits or you're doing it for a specific reason. Don't just evoke willy-nilly, evoke for a reason. There's many rituals that you can just do daily and that I recommend. I'm a big believer in the daily practice. And there are some rituals that you will do monthly. Uh, I'm currently working with some Hecate stuff. And so every month on the new moon, I have to do a Hecatean ritual. Evocation is not like that. Obviously, evocation has specific timings related to it. Depending on your system, you're almost always gonna have a list of planetary timings and requirements. Follow those diligently. Uh, the Arbitel I've been working with kind of sucks because it makes me do the rituals in the morning, which I'm not a morning person, but I have made myself get up to do them because you don't really wanna fudge that. If you have to fudge it, typically planetary days and hours can make it a little better, but I would recommend sticking to the script, especially the first few times you're working with an evocation. So know what you're doing, do your research, time it properly. And when it comes to tools, oftentimes evocation requires a lot of tools. We're talking banners, layman's, circles. You can make a lot of that yourself. You can buy some of it on Etsy, though not always. Making it yourself is actually a good process. And I find that when you make your own tools, you sort of imbue your energy with it. I'm not crafty, I'm not good with crafts. So mine always look a little gross, but there's a reason why I don't post them to Instagram, right? They get the job done, they may not be Instagram ready, but yeah. 
And for me, there are certain things that I do buy. If I know I just can't make it myself or I use it a ton and want a nicer version, I will buy things. There's no shame in buying tools, but making them is a really good idea, especially when we talk about the grimoires because that's what people had to do for the longest time. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say about evocation. I wish you luck if you decide to embark on evocation. And if you're someone who evokes, I think it'd be really cool if you put some of your experiences in the comments so that people who are watching this video can read some of the experiences of how evocation goes so they can get a sense on if it's what they want to do. Because deciding to invoke or evoke is a complex theological question that I think occultists have to tackle pretty early on. And it's one that people should be thinking about. So thank you for watching. Um, I'm back from my hiatus. It feels good to be back. Feels nice to be back in the vibe. I'll be making another video in about two weeks. If you want to support me, I give an extra video every month, ritual guides and more on my Patreon. That's the best way to support me uh, as well. I am on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Telegram. I'm on most social media platforms uh, as well. I do host a podcast. Uh, it was called Magnolia's on Magic. We were on hiatus with that. I have been posting in the meantime, little bonus podcasts to the Patreon. So if you open the Patreon, I have like little baby mini podcasts that are just me. My most recent one was about true will versus free will. And my next one's going to be about is Thelema the Tantra of the West, which is a really exciting topic I want to cover. Um, I'll be coming back with a new podcast, new name, new co-host really soon. I'm excited to announce that we're on our new chapter as a channel and I'm excited to see the growth. I think that oftentimes new beginnings are beautiful and I'm excited to embark on my new beginning. So find me places, support me. Thank you so much. Like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell. And if you're subscribed for 93 days, you'll meet your holy garden angel and you will not need to evoke those demons. All right, goodbye.